Good evening, I'm Jose Cardenas. Tonight, we'll talk about the seats open for Phoenix City Council and the issues facing each district, and a discussion about the first anniversary of the implementation of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Directive. Plus, an ASU professor is Arizona's first poet laureate. We'll talk to the professor about this special honor. All this coming up next on Horizonte. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you for joining us. Four city Phoenix Council seats are up for grabs on Tuesday's primary, District 2, 4, 6, and 8. District 4 and 8 face particularly competitive races because the current council representatives are not running for re-election. Joining me to talk about the Phoenix City Council races is Dustin Gardner, Phoenix City Hall reporter for the Arizona Republic. Dustin, welcome to Horizonte. Thanks for having uh, me. Particularly interesting council races this year, in part uh, with the exception of District uh, 2, because they're so competitive and, and in many respects so nasty. So let's start. Uh, District right. 2 is, is representative, uh, is City Council member uh, Waring and not much of an issue there, right? I mean, he's going to easily win that, right. that race. Right, not much competition there at all. But uh, much different in, uh, in District 4. Let's talk about that one first. Who are the leading candidates? So District 4, which is Tom Simplot's seat in the central part of the city, and he has decided not to run again after about 10 years on the council. Uh, the three leading candidates so far have been Justin Johnson, uh, the son of former Mayor Paul Johnson, Laura Pastor, a uh, daughter of well-known Congressman Ed Pastor, and David Lujan, a former state legislator. This, this race, it hasn't been quite as contentious as some of the others, but it's certainly been competitive. There's a lot of money pouring in there, far more than anyone in that race has seen for more than a decade. And some of the big issues have been, you know, what people in the central city, especially historic neighborhoods, care about, historic preservation, um, restoration of city services. And part of that uh, has been a lot of discussion about the city's food tax uh, the candidates have a little bit different positions on that. Justin Johnson was kind of the first to really come out and push and say that he would repeal it immediately. Um, David Lujan has said the same thing. Um, and Laura Pastor has been a little more skeptical from her standpoint. She's wanted to kind of wait and see what the impact might be to city services, whereas the other candidates have kind of taken the tact more that we, didn't, we never needed it and we can get rid of it now. And you're right. This race uh, in this district has not been characterized by some of the ugliness that some of the other districts are, are facing. Um, and, and it's more a question of uh, who's the best successor to Tom Simplot, including who might best represent the gay community, of, of which he was a, a, a rather prominent leader. Right. Um, yeah, all the candidates have made a lot of efforts to certainly reach out to that community. I think they were all supportive of the non-discrimination ordinance that uh, Mayor Stan and the city council passed last year. So that because there's not a gay candidate who is among that leading group, it's, they've all sort of shared part of that piece, that pie, I think. Now, uh, although the Republic endorsed uh, David Lujan, uh, my sense from uh, discussions I've heard is that he's probably in third place as, as amongst those three. Now, we haven't seen any official polling, but that's sort of the sense that you get from talking to political insiders and campaign workers. He has far less money. I think he, as of the last filing early this summer, Justin Johnson had almost three times as much money as him. So in terms of sheer competition, I think he's probably behind. So are we expecting a runoff there between uh, Pastor and Johnson? It's hard to imagine a scenario where there's not a runoff um, with that many candidates. There's seven candidates in that race, um, three well-known heavy hitters. Um, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a runoff heading into November. Let's go to District 6, and that, that really has been probably the ugliest campaign of, of, of the three that are really competitive. Tell us about that one. District 6 has been the focus of much of the contention. The most money by far, hands down, is being sent there. It's being spent there. Um, incumbent Sal DeCicio is facing a very spirited, nasty fight from Carleen Keogh Parks, a well-known insurance executive and philanthropist. Um, a lot of the focus in that race has been on the role of city unions. Uh, Sal has said that's the, that the election is essentially a referendum on his fiscal reforms. He hasn't gotten along with the unions uh, in part because of his efforts to re uh, overhaul city pension systems, uh, opposition to city pay raises for employees. Uh, on the other hand, Carlene, she has framed the race a little bit differently. In her eyes, this is a matter of restoring civility and respect on the city council. She describes DeCicio as a flamethrower, and he certainly has a reputation for being outspoken. So it, we're seeing a lot of mailers, a lot of contention, and frankly, probably one of the ugliest 
city council races that we've seen in many years. Now, uh, you mentioned that DeCicio, uh has been targeted in part because of his opposition to raises for city employees, right. but he's also been criticized for being supportive of, of the raise for the city manager. Now, he did vote for the $78,000 raise that David Cavazos got. Um, DeCicio's argument has been that, that that raise has paid off. Um, it, the city manager has pushed uh, for a lot of efficiency savings and trying to implement the, say, the, the fiscal reforms that DeCicio has pushed. Uh, but that certainly has been the... Well, and, and Cavasso's yeah. decision to leave is, is, is not reflecting well on, on DeCicio, at least in terms of the wisdom of, of that big of a pay And Carlene has certainly seized on that point. She's made it very clear that he supported that raise. And, and now that, that uh, the city manager is leaving, that certainly controversy is not going away. A lot of outside money in that race? Do you a, think it's going to have an impact? A lot of outside money. A, a lot of the money is coming from uh, unions around the state, public safety, firefighter unions that are have a very bad relationship with Sal the CCO. They, they, view, they view him as being unfriendly to public safety. Um, and we're seeing this through various independent expenditure groups. Uh, the most well-known is probably the group that has put up these firefighters, or not firefighters, lobbyists and developers support Sal the CCO signs. And I know a lot of the mailers are going in that race. I'm hearing some people getting them almost every other day are coming from that union money. Let's go on to District 8, another uh, very competitive race with some, some very prominent names. Uh, the most prominent name, at least in terms of his history uh, in the city of Phoenix, is Pastor Warren Stewart. Yeah, so District 8 was Michael Johnson, the 12-year uh, incumbent on the city council. He cannot run again due to term limits, so it's another open seat. Um, the three leading candidates in that race have been Pastor Warren Stewart, who is well known for having led the fight uh, to create a statewide holiday for honoring uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and then you also have Kate Gallego, uh, who's a business liaison and the wife of state, la state lawmaker Ruben Gallego. And then we also have Lawrence Robinson, who's a school board member and attorney. Um, this race has been intensely competitive. Um, Kate Gallego has raised the most money by far and is by many insiders perceived to be the front runner. She's done a lot more mail has just a lot bigger organization and presence. And in this race, a lot of the focus has been on the kind of the, 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 the concern that the district has been too neglected, been overlooked by the city for a long time. There's a lot of poverty and concerns about vacant lots, um, lack of city and services. And somewhat a, a criticism of, of Councilman Johnson. It, for, in the eyes of uh, Lawrence Robinson and Kate Gallego, it certainly is. Um, they haven't named him very often, but they have said that the district has not gotten the, the representation it needs. And, and while you accurately described it as an open seat because there's no incumbent, it, it's also a seat that many people think should be held by an African-American. Many leaders of the African-American community, uh, we're talking about uh, ministers, longtime business leaders, they feel that this seat should should belong to an African-American, that the city needs that that voice on the council. The, the history has been that since the district was created in the early 80s, it has always been represented by an African-American. Uh, a lot of people want to fight to preserve that. Uh, the problem has been that Pastor Warren Stewart's campaign has struggled, especially compared to Kate Gallego. He's brought in, he's brought in way less money. There's been a lot of internal issues with his campaign, um, uh, p people squabbling from the inside. So we'll see how that shakes out. And we should note that Lawrence Robinson is African-American. He, he's also African-American. That's, that's right. And uh, received the endorsement of the Republic. Yes. So on that note, we're going to end the interview. Uh, who do you expect to come out the winner there, though? I, you know, I can't say, but the, the leaders of those three, um, at, you know, I think Kay Iago is going to do really well, and the other two, we'll see where they end up. Justin Gardner, thanks for joining us to right, talk about you. these uh, very contentious, very exciting races. Yep. To find out more information about what's on Horizonte, go to azpbs.org and click on the Horizonte tab at the top of the screen. There you can access many features to become a more informed Horizonte viewer. Watch interviews by clicking on the video button or by scrolling down to the bottom of the page for the most recent segments. Learn about more specific topics like arts and culture and immigration. You can also find out what's on Horizonte for the upcoming week. If you would like an RSS feed, a podcast, or you want to buy a video, that's all on our website, too. Other features include our collection of website links and a special page for educators. While you're there, show your support for Horizonte with just one click. Discover all that's on Horizonte. Visit azpbs.org, Horizonte, today. One year ago, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, known as DACA, 
was implemented. DACA is an initiative of the Obama administration. It does not provide permanent lawful status to applicants. However, it does give approved applicants a temporary suspension of deportation and authorization to work in the United States. Joining me now to talk about the impact the program has had on eligible young people is immigration attorney Regina Jeffries. Also here is Carmen Cornejo with Cadena and the Arizona Dream Act Coalition. Thank you both for joining us once again on Horizonte. It's good to have you both back uh, to talk about uh, basically the one-year anniversary of uh, DACA. So let's start with an overview from each of you as to, as to what you think we've seen in the course of the last year. Carmen, you first. Yes, challenges and opportunities. I think um, DACA has provided a lot of peace of mind to the students uh, not to be subject to deportations anymore. And also the work permit is a blessing. However, there's a lot of challenges, especially here in Arizona. Um, I can mention the driver's license issue. We don't have, um, uh, the, uh, they don't have the access to the driver's license, which becomes also an ID issue. And it's preventing sometimes for them access some types of types of work. You know, the most recent assessments uh, have been a little uh, pessimistic, mm -hmm. I mean, I at least in the articles that have been in the paper recently, suggesting that there's a lot of fanfare, but really not much has changed. Do you disagree with that? I disagree. I think uh, it's, it's, un it's unleashing a lot of the potential that the young persons have. Um, the changes are not going to come like immediately. It's a process. Uh, the employers also need to understand uh, the documentation that are represented. So um, they are not uh, changing radically speaking their lives economically speaking. However, this, this process is starting and it's, we're gonna see the effects, the positive effects of this initiative in, in some years. Regina, what have you seen? I, I would echo a lot of what Carmen has said. I mean, I think what this has done is really continued the conversation um, for these young kids. And, and like Carmen's saying, I mean, it hasn't, drastically change the economic opportunities for them in part because, um, well, at least in Arizona, some of the um, negative initiatives from um, the state that we've seen regarding driver's licenses and basically placing other obstacles for people legally allowed to work. Um, but we, we also have seen some confusion about um, what the actual employment authorization document means. Confusion what, amongst employers? Yeah, exactly. Um, people not understanding that um, at least for the I-9 process, you know, one of the things that someone can present is a uh, employment authorization document from the federal government and a social security card, which are two documents that DREAMers under this plan or the Deferred Action recipients can actually get and are entitled to, and an employer cannot ask for additional documents on top of that. So, What's your sense of, of the numbers both nationally and, and locally? in terms of, of those who are taking advantage of, of this status? Well, I think I can speak on a national level. I think Carmen can probably give a better idea of what's happening on an Arizona uh, level, but I think that there have been over half a million applications for um, DACA on a national level, and I think as of uh, right now, there have been over 350,000 approvals. Um, I think I, I can't really give an exact number, but How it's... How does that stack up with what people were expecting when the program was first announced? It's less than, I think, what people were expecting, but I will say that there's one thing I think those numbers don't take into account and it's one thing that I saw actually when I started talking to potential DACA applicants is that a lot of these kids are eligible for other types of immigration relief or, or applications that they may not have known about previously and so I was actually able in a lot of cases to do other things more permanent solutions for for kids and I know a lot of attorneys um, and, and other organizations like Chicanos por la Causa and, and other community organizations were able to help um, kids out with. So. Carmen, uh, both you and Regina have indicated that, that the situation in Arizona may be such that people aren't as, as uh, likely to go and seek this status. Uh, what's going on there? Well, there's a lot of barriers for, for the young uh, immigrants to access the process of DACA. The money is very important. $465 is a lot of money for poor families. And sometimes the families have one or two or three uh, uh, possible applicants. So it's a big barrier. Um, there's also a lot of misinformation still about the process. I think the 19,000 19, that uh, have already applied for DACA are the ones that had all the information in their hands. 19,000 in Arizona? In Arizona. Okay. I, 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 um, but they are the, the ones who were better prepared that knew they were expecting something or some uh, like, a, like a, a small part of them participating in the advocacy to ask for, for a process of administrative relief. 
uh, and they're the better prepared to uh, put forward the documentation, but we still have a lot of persons who have not all the information. There's also the barrier of the GED situation. They cannot, they, they haven't completed the high school requirement and the GED, but they, uh, ADACA allows them to apply for a program of GED and access the process. Uh, but they are still trying to find the, la uh, the right place to access the GED um, instruction. And are they being uh, turned down by, by the officials in charge of that program, or what's happening? Well, uh, the program is the funding. If the state funds the GED program, they are not going to have access to it because um, uh, um, the le legislation here in Arizona. However, there's community organizations that offer uh, tuition-based uh, instruction. They can access that. Sometimes it's expensive. I always recommend them to go to Rio Salado uh, because that is not funded by the state. Uh, the only problem is that the instruction is online, only uh, the one that they can access. Uh, Regina, one of the other things that seems to be discouraging people and has been discussed in some of the articles recently is the fact that while these uh, people are able to get uh, their employer authorization um, document, they can't get to work because they can't get driver's license. Right. What's the status of the litigation involving that issue? Um, the status of the litigation, it's still, um, the, the judge essentially um, refused to issue a preliminary injunction, um, but the case is still pending in federal court. And so I think that um, we'll have to kind of wait and see where things go with that. But um, it does seem that the judge has indicated that the, uh, the ACLU and the plaintiff side does have a strong position uh, on, on that, on the legislation, uh, excuse me, on the litigation. Carmen, uh, one of the issues that's come to light recently are, are groups from outside the state of Arizona mm -hmm. who have come in here and have staged some events uh, that have been subject to criticism, most recently the group that sent some people across the border and then had them try to get back into the United States mm -hmm. successfully, at least temporarily. Mm -hmm. I, I know you've had some concerns about that. What are yes. you? Uh, it's the same group that organized a civil disobedience event, which was very confrontational a couple of years ago. Um, yes, and they're going state by state doing those kind of events. Um, I have a lot of concerns about that because um, they are tweaking with the concept of asylum, political asylum. And, um, and, and other considerations that are <laughs> into the lawyer's um, uh, discretion. And also, um, we don't want them to see, um, uh, to, to the, the dreamers to be seen as a political activist so much. Um, I think uh, we need to um, have them in a very positive view as fighting for their education and fighting for the benefits that are entitled under the DACA program. So based upon what you both said, uh, a lot of progress over the last year, but, but a lot more to do, I, I take it. A lot of exactly. things to do. Well, thanks uh, to both of you for joining us this evening to talk about that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Get the inside scoop on what's happening at Arizona PBS. Become an aid insider. You'll receive weekly updates on the most anticipated upcoming programs and events. Get the 8 Insider delivered to your email inbox. Visit azpbs.org to sign up today. Here at Horizonte, we want to hear from you. If you have comments, story ideas, or questions, email us at horizonte at asu.edu. It's a special honor for an ASU professor. The Arizona Commission on the Arts, in partnership with the Office of the Governor, announced that celebrated poet and Arizona State University Regents Professor Alberto Rios has been named the first poet laureate for Arizona. You may recognize him from a program here on 8. He is the host of Books and Company, a program where writers come on the show to discuss their work. Joining me now is Arizona's inaugural poet laureate, Professor Alberto Rios. Professor Rios, welcome to Horizonte. Uh, you were Thank not... You. Uh, simply the inaugural uh, Poet Laureate, you were the inaugural guest <laughs> for the show that you now host. Books and Company, that's true. It's quite a long while back. but 25 I 25 years ago. The very first guest. Yeah, I, I, I think was about got, 12. We got a picture of, well, uh, the picture we have, <laughs> I, I, I don't think you're, you were 12. You look a little older than that, unless you were, had a beard when you were 12. Oh, my goodness. But uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's been a long and storied career for you here in Arizona. Give us kind of a thumbnail sketch of your background and how you came to to be the, the writer that you are? Well, you know, it's, it's an Arizona story, but uh, not one you hear too much today. I was, I was born in Nogales. Uh, my father was born in Tapachula and Chiapas on the border of Guatemala in Mexico. My mother was from England. She was born in Warrington, Lancashire, England, and she was what I later learned was a war, war bride. They came uh, to live in Nogales. It's a long and, and quite wonderful story. 
and it's hard to imagine my mother, you know, very, very light, uh, very diminutive, living in that town. As with an was, English accent. With an English so. accent. She was the English nurse. She was a nurse. But she did. And she gave me something that I later came to see was very simple. It was perspective. I grew up with a lot of languages, a lot of cultures, really. There's, there's border culture along with, uh, with uh, you know, English, literal English culture and Mexican culture, American culture and border culture. It helped me to see from the very beginning that there was always going to be more than one way to look at something. And, and when you talk about the very beginning, you we're talking about you at a real young age. I mean, not, not, not yeah. what you claim to be in that picture, yeah. but, but you started yeah. writing as a, as a youngster. Yeah. What, I can remember when my first act of writing was recognizable to me, but it had nothing to do with putting paper to, uh, pen to paper. It was second grade, and uh, I got in trouble. I had committed the egregious sin of daydreaming. My parents were called in, and and that's uh, a sin. And that's a that was a sin no, in tr- second I'm grade, in, I'm in right? Anymore. Well, well, we're all in trouble. I I hope, <laughs> but my parents were called in, and uh, they were sitting in the little second grader chairs, listening to the teacher explain. He's a very good student, and whatever, but he daydreams. Class had great big windows, and and uh, and I did. Well, my parents, I th- I thought I was in a lot of trouble, and. I thought maybe you know no dinner for me or you know did get you know it was the days of the belt and all that sort of stuff and I didn't know what was in store for me as a, I was a second grader and you know you you have all of these kinds of reasoning uh, that sounds silly now but as a second grader you only have second grader reasoning so you I thought I was in trouble my parents listened they said he's been daydreaming yes so they they took me home we, I was alone in the back seat of the car and in the 50s those car back seats were huge so my brother wasn't with me. I thought, oh, my God, this is, I'm being, you know, castigated already. They take me home. My mother makes dinner. We, we watch some TV. We had one of the first TVs in the neighborhood, and so everybody would come, and I thought I was going to be excluded from that. No Laurel and Hardy for me. They let me watch TV. We went to bed. I thought I was going to have bad dreams, whatever. My parents never raised it as an issue. And what I came to see later is they were giving me one of the great gifts in my life. You figure it out. You decide. We know it's in you to understand that what you did was not wrong. They didn't have to tell me. So it wasn't Laurel and Hardy, but but you end up being the poet laureate. We should talk quickly about yeah. what that means. This is, you're the first one for Arizona. What what, right. what are your obligations? Well, the obligations I, are are uh, pro forma. I've got to give some readings, do some some things around uh, the state, visit uh, rural and urban communities, kind of do everything there is to do regarding poetry, which is impossible. But I love that challenge. It's a good challenge, and I also am supposed to come up with a a, a major literary. Mm, thing. Nobody, nobody can kind of come to grips with that, but I'm ready for that. I don't want to impose what I think ought to be done. I think there are a lot of great ideas for what Arizona might do with language. And you just had a, a, an experience recently that, that maybe could be the kind of thing yeah. that, that you might do, and it's something you did in South Phoenix. Yeah, this is South that. Phoenix uh, Community uh, Library, where uh, we, I, I did some various things. I've got some Poems that are in the shade trellises that, that they get projected. The sun comes through and it projects these poems onto people walking under them or onto the page of the ground. It's, it's a, a very cool thing. Along with that, we did something uh, that was pretty innovative. We did a community poem in which we advertised only within the community for people to send in some to the library, send in some lines, some thoughts, some, some words, some language regarding having grown up in, in South Phoenix. No rules. I didn't know what we would get. And then you put it all together and in a poem. And then I put it all together in a poem. Uh, got a, had our day. The poem was put in a broadside. It's, it's permanently on the, the wall of the library. And when we were reading it that day, I didn't, had not met any of the writers, didn't know who they were. They were there. I, I started to call them one by one to come up and stand behind me as I read this poem. First gentleman comes up, a woman comes up, third or fourth uh, person in, I call the name, and it's like this 10-year-old kid. And I said, you wrote that? He said, yeah, I'm a writer. I said, excellent. Glad to meet you. We shook hands. It was like a Disney moment, and it would seem not to get better than that. He stood behind me, but the next name I called was his mother. 
And I thought, that's a community poem. And, and th that's going to be forever there on that wall. Those two people from two you know, generations, uh, single family. It's a, it's a story worth, uh, worth telling and, and separate from And it's a great story, and thank you so much for sharing it with us. Yeah. Congratulations again on, on this you. great honor, and thanks for joining us tonight. It was a pleasure. That's our show for tonight. From all of us here at Horizonte, I'm Jose Cardenas. Have a good evening. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station.